Hello everyone, I am here with Paula Jean Swearingen running for the United States Senate in West Virginia. You all know her, you all love her. She's back to give us an update about her campaign. Paula, welcome back to the program. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Mike. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. You're great and thank you for always amplifying progressive voices. Well, thank you. Thank you for running. And I had to bring you back because we're in a really different situation currently. You know, you ran against Joe Manchin mm-hmm. and you got a large portion of the vote but didn't win and we were gutted. But now you're back and you're the favorite. Mm-hmm. You're running a very viable campaign and you can win this. So talk about the dynamics and how you can actually defeat Shelley Capito Moore. Well, um, you know, well, for first of all, let's talk about personal reasons and why I'm running against her. She's out, you know, she's voted against equal pay for women three times. Um, she's a mother and a grandmother. She's been in office for almost 20 years. Her dad was our former governor. And um, she's basically a rubber stamp for, you know, like Mitch McConnell. And uh, she was elected to be the first United States senator, first woman to be to represent West Virginia in the U.S. Senate. And um, she's really did nothing for us. And she's a mother and she's a grandmother. And she's turned her back on the children dying and starving in this state. And it's time for her to face a mother and a grandmother and, uh, you know, kick her out, make sure that we do have a good voice in Washington and have a good, strong woman in Washington. Because I think that maybe have been West Virginia's intent to send her there, but she's not taking care of women and children in this state. And our state, the population in West Virginia is like 51, 52 percent women. And, uh, you know, we are not divided by partisan politics when it comes to our children and women are ready to fight back. Um, It's been really incredible, and I want to thank everybody across the nation that has supported this campaign this time. Um, It really solidifies that you can have a people-funded campaign. We have outraised everyone eight to one. Um, We have an incredible staff. I have an incredible campaign manager, finance director, comms director, incredible people in field. A lot of people have um, signed up to volunteer to make phone calls and to send texts during this pandemic. And actually, a lot of West Virginians that don't live in the state anymore have donated to the campaign just because they want to come back home. Yeah, this is really incredible because, you know, what I hear from congressional candidates who have run multiple times is that the first time, you know, you run and it's difficult. You kind of try to find your footing. But the second time you build up a really well-oiled machine, you have connections, you have, you know, a lot of people that you know who become your staffers. And now your campaign is incredible. So the, the eight to one fundraising that really is important because you are a campaign everyone in my audience knows you're not taking any money from large multinational corporations Mm -hmm. this is all people powered so that fact in and of itself is astonishing and now that you're positioned to win it's it's incredible like it feels like we actually can affect change and for everyone who's feeling demoralized about the 2020 election since bernie sanders didn't win you know these congressional races this is our fight now. This is where we can affect change. It, it's right. not all over. 2020 is still, you know, uh, the election is months away. And races like this, imagine if Paula Jean Swearingen were to be elected to the U.S. Senate. The things that you would accomplish, I, I think you would be very effective. Because, you know, for you, something that you said before you went on, it, it stood out with me. And you've said this before. This is a fight for survival. This isn't about, you know, a Van B project. You're not running right. because you you think that this is, you know, a good career opportunity for you. You're running because this is a fight for survival. So let's say you get elected, you get sworn in in 2021. What is going to be your first policy priorities? Because assuming Donald Trump is defeated and let's just say Democrats take back, you know, uh, the Senate and they have the White House, what are you going to push for? Because there's going to be a lot of voices, you know, in in Congress, in the Senate that will try to marginalize you. Chuck Schumer probably will try to marginalize you, as we've seen from other progressives, you know, with regard to the House and Nancy Pelosi. So what do you think you would really push for immediately in terms of relief for Americans? Um, We'll get to that. But let's talk about our movement for a second and the importance. Um, That's one of the reasons, too, that I decided to run for United States Senate because Uh, We do need good, strong people representatives in Congress, and the Senate plays a large role in electing um, the Supreme Court, so it's vitally important. And one person can't go go to Congress and change everything. So this is a movement. It continues to grow. No matter who our president is, we have to have a good, strong Congress. And everybody, you know, don't give up hope. 
we have a whole slate of candidates with brand new Congress. I worked with them in 2018, and I'm incredibly proud of brand new Congress. And I fully believe in them because of the way they vet their candidates. And they give voters a chance of having real people representatives and that, what, how, without having to go through the weeds and pick out who actually has integrity. So, you know, don't forget brand new Congress, brand new Congress dot org, because if I do go to Congress, it's not going to be just me. Uh, it, it's going to have to take a whole slate of candidates. And, um, you know, it, it's it's going to take a bunch of us. We have to keep on pushing that needle, too. We're going to suffer losses and we have in our movement, but we've also had some wins. And even if we don't win, we keep on pushing that needle with our incumbents. We They know that we're holding them more accountable. Even with Joe Manchin, we've seen him make better decisions this year because we have pushed him so hard. I've given credit for some of the things that he's done. And, you know, we we if we hold them accountable, then they'll do better. But if they don't do better, then they need to know that we're going to come take their jobs. Um as far as when I get there, we still have a chance for Medicare for all. I still stand behind Medicare for all 100%. The first thing I would do in Congress is co-sponsor Medicare for all. And it's going to take all of us to push whoever our president is to make sure that it's implemented. Because even the Trump administration promised us universal health care. I'm behind Bernie's bill because it, it uh, it's comprehensive. It covers uh, dental and vision. But also in that bill is just transition for people that work in insurance companies. And that's important to me because even here in West Virginia with the, you know, with the uh, loss in the market for the coal industry, people are dying and starving. So when we do advance and grow, we have to make sure that we do have just transition. Secondary to that, you know, it's important to me to make sure that we combat the addiction epidemic, not only in my state, but in my across the country. And right now, West Virginia leads and drug overdose deaths. And I want to send federal funding to long-term recovery systems. We have seen uh, with the people that are working to combat this crisis in the front lines of our communities and across the country that long-term recovery systems work. We've been hearing from our incumbents that they are gonna take care of the addiction epidemic and drug replacement therapy plays a small role in ending addiction because it takes that money from big pharma, you know, takes that money from big pharma and puts it right back into big pharma. And it's it's not creating long-term solutions. And it's been proven statistically that long-term recovery systems work and they need state and federal funding and they need support from medical providers and social workers. I will fight for a living wage. I mean, I'll fight for everything that I've always fought for. Um, economic diversity for my state and sta- states like mine is very important to me. The Industrial Revolution was built on the backs of West Virginians, their families and surrounding communities. When you turn on your light switch, it's been, you know, it's it's by the blood of Appalachians. And the least that we can do is invest in things like the Reclaim Act, the Green New Deal, and make sure that uh, we put funding in states like ours so we can grow and diversify our economy. Uh, When we look at diversification for our economy in West Virginia, if we legalize cannabis, which I am for legalization and decriminalization 100%, we would see economic growth in our state within six to eight months. If we grew hemp on mountaintop removal sites, not only would it clean up, clean up the soil, it cre- create topsoil, and you know we could tap into that agriculture. Um, we have a lot of hot spots for uh, geothermal and hydropower here in the state. Um, we can invest in that. A lot of people don't have comprehensive broadband across the state. We've heard from our senators that they're going to give some relief and and make sure that we have comprehensive broadband, but it doesn't happen. It seems like it's a political talking point. If we have good roads, we have good schools, we have a good infrastructure, we invest in clean water, clean air, and create a place where businesses will want to come and grow here, then then business, business will come here. And we, you know, there's all kinds of ideas we could have for the Appalachian region, but we just need visionaries for our future instead of visionaries for our demise and make sure that we get dark money out of politics and we have true people servants as opposed to people that are serving corporations, lobbyists, and special interests. Uh, you know, there's so many things that we could be doing across the country. Even with this pandemic, I'm really, really frustrated to see states suffer like mine uh, because of population. They're opening up West Virginia, and uh, this is one of the poorest and sickest states in the nation. We have high rates of lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, a large 
uh, bulk of our population is the elderly. And instead of sending relief efforts in the National Guard out into the hills and hollers where people haven't seen daylight, and we don't know what's going on with them living in food deserts, they're talking about opening up our state. So on a state level, we should be taking care of uh, the people here. And on a federal level, we hear so much uh, fr that, well, we've got to open up the economy. But we also, in the last stimulus bill, gave over to, you know trillions of dollars to corporations and Wall Street you know, on only $1,200, and some of those people have not even received those stimulus checks and, and relief. Um, we can afford $2,000 a month until we figure this out. Public health and safety should not come last, and I know even specifically for my state, how can we trust these people to take care of us when we were treated like collateral damage to begin with? West Virginia shouldn't be a test case or any state any state in this country. We need to lock down, take care of people, make sure that they have personal protective equipment, the tools that they need to take care of people, make sure that people are fed, they can pay their bills and they're not homeless until we do figure this out. And this just really solidifies the failure in our government that we can't handle a pandemic like this. Yeah, absolutely. Like all of the flaws that already existed pre-COVID-19, they just bubble up to the surface to where if you didn't see them before, there's no way that you don't see them now. And as you go through like your list of all these policy things you want to fight for, something just, you know, stood out to me, like why you're such a phenomenal candidate and why I'm so invested in this campaign and in you as a politician is because your idea of what you should do, what you should fight for, it doesn't change based on the political context. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's this sense now that, okay, Bernie lost, Medicare for all is done. We can't get it. So, you know, best case scenario, you get to Congress and maybe we get a public option. You're still saying, no, I don't care who's president. We're fighting for Medicare for all. That's, That's the right, right policy. That's right. And that is so important because that is true political courage and that's one thing that i think is lacking with lawmakers you know the thing with politics is that you are expected to be overly savvy and you're supposed to you know use your political capital wisely but that time is gone like we are at the end of the empire like the country is collapsing so there's no time for these silly little games in political theater we just need relief we need the policies that will save lives and there's no debate like we know which policies are needed you just listed all of them so there's no room for discussion there's no time for that that time has come and gone now we get those policies and we fight regardless so i, I think that's just such an important thing for you to say that you know I, it doesn't matter who wins i'm still fighting for medicare for all that doesn't change you know the calculus the trajectory it's not changing because we didn't get a bernie president it doesn't change if you know trump is reelected. What's right is right, and we still fight for those policies. So that's why I just love your campaign so much, and I feel so like attached to this campaign because this is a fight for survival. This isn't about anything other than that. Like we're trying to fight for people in West Virginia, in your case, but also the species. Because I mean, we're dealing that's with right. a pandemic where, uh, as we record this, almost a hundred thousand Americans have died. Like I don't think right. we're going to really realize the scale of you know the destruction and devastation until we we are like past this until we're out of this because right now so much is going on i think that psychologically a lot of people myself at least you just kind of like try to tune it out because it's it's so painful it's like this type of like uh coping mechanism in a way but i want to talk about your race because this time with you running it's so important you're you're so, you're doing a lot you can win this thing um, and so there's a challenger that jumped in. There's an establishment Democrat who isn't really doing that great, which kind of leaves the door open for you. But another person who individuals mm -hmm. perceived as progressive, got a lot of coverage in indie media, is Richard Ojeda. Now, you had announced mm -hmm. that you were running and he decided to jump in the race rather than endorsing you, which doesn't make sense to me. Because if I prioritize policies, if I want Medicare for all, if I want a Green New Deal, and I already see a well-established candidate running a great campaign in the race, I don't jump in myself because what's the point of that? I endorse that candidate. I campaign for that candidate. So he could have been a phenomenal ally, but he chose to run against you, which doesn't make sense to me. What Do you want to respond to the Richard Ojeda um, situation? Because it seems as if he, in this instance, rather than endorsing you, could siphon away votes from you from progressives who don't necessarily know that you are the real deal. You're the better candidate, I think, objectively speaking, if you're on the left. So do you want to speak to that at all? 
I believe in democracy. I believe that anybody can run for office if they want to. However, when we strategically think about this movement, you know, we had we need to think about how to take, you know, the, the main goal was to get rid of Shelley Moore Capito. You know, that's our bad guy. Right. Or supposed to be. But um, I think oftentimes people are in this for the wrong reasons. They are more in it to get famous instead of actually staying on point. And I think West Virginians deserve consistency. They don't need um, somebody that's going to pull back from Medicare for all or is going to be wishy-washy about coal. They support it one day, the next day they don't. And that's the worst lie a politician can tell is the coal industry is going to rebound. We had over 170 coal miners and 120,000 coal miners in the 1970s. We, nationwide, we have less than 50,000. And the rug has been pulled out from under West Virginians. And it's not, you know, we just we shouldn't be making decisions, just like you said, for political expediency. Not only West Virginia, but everybody across the country needs consistency and they need integrity. I'm not in this to be famous. I'm a country girl. I don't want to go to D.C., but I'd cut my leg off for my kids in West Virginians. And that's why I even think about going is because we're underserved and this nation was built by the people, for the people and of the people. And who better to serve us than us? We have been solving our problems in the front lines of our communities for decades. Why our incumbents are serving corporations and lobbyists. And um, I fought for my state for years. And the reason I'm running for office, too, is because I'm tired of begging. I'm tired of people in my state begging for something so basic as a clean glass of water and a job. And we can have both. Um, in addition to that, you know, we don't need somebody lying to us and saying that they're not taking dark money when the FEC says otherwise. Uh, we, you know, we don't need people that are forty five thousand dollars in debt from their last race. And we don't need somebody that's going to. A win an election, have West Virginians work hard to get them into a seat and then them turn around, quit their seat four days later, you know, four days later, run for president and then quit their seat again. Uh, you know, we just don't deserve that. We need consistency. I can't tell you what my opponent is you know, thinking, but we have proven what, that we're the most viable. And uh, I just encourage everybody just to continue to vet your candidates and keep your eye on the prize. Because uh, there's a lot of people that have tried to hijack the pres progressive movement. And we do have a lot of fake progressives. You know, you can research where their money comes from. You can look at their history and look at the videos. That, you know, uh, Google is a, a great tool right now. So you can find out more about your candidates. I can't tell you why he's doing it, it you know, but... The main goal for me is to make sure that we have true representation in Washington. And one thing that I want to add about that, too, is West Virginians are tired of not having a seat at the table. When somebody goes into you know, an elected office, they're just not there to, to just be a voice, but they should be a medium for the people that they're supposed to serve. And so it's important to me when I do go to Congress that all these people that I've worked with throughout the years that I've, I've seen in the front lines of our communities battle and addiction, you know, making sure that our children are fed during crises, uh, make, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, we're combating poverty and all these things that are going on in my state, that they have a seat at the table. They're going to, you know, West Virginians are going to help me and people across the country help me write legislation um, and that I introduce because it's important to me that West Virginians do have a voice. Uh, I want to be a public servant and that's what we deserve. And I know there's a lot of people that have went into Congress and sell out. They're barking up the wrong tree. Like I said, I don't even want to be there. I'd cut my leg off for my grandchildren and, and children. And I'm doing this because we have to survive. People actually are dying and starving every day. This pandemic even solidifies it. Essential workers need essential things like jobs and being able to pay their, I mean, you know, food and be able to pay their rent. And I'm just tired of living like we do. And I'm tired of begging people that are supposed to serve us and they've not done anything, especially for West Virginia. They've been pissing on our backs and saying it's raining for years and we're tired of being abused. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm glad that you said that about, um, you know, you don't want to be in Congress because that's ideally the person who you want to represent you someone who doesn't want to be there someone who isn't running because you know you can become a celebrity or an influencer um and i'm also glad that you pointed out the fact that you know this is a democracy as left-wingers we support democracy because you know in my race in district one of oregon i had a really great uh set of choices. So there were two women running, Amanda Seavey and Heidi Briones, and this was a real like 
fantastic uh, campaign between the both of them because you had Amanda Seabee, who was championing uh, disability rights and Medicare for all. And then you had mm -hmm. Heidi Briones, who was really pushing for UBI. And between both of them, you could you could tell that there was like this real sense that they have different competing priorities. But in this instance, in your race, it's not like, you know, Richard Ojeda chose to jump in because he he's really committed to one set of ideals. We don't know where he mm -hmm. stands on Medicare for all. He supported a public option and then he said he supported Medicare for all. He voted for Trump in 2016 and then he apparently was a Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, he is supposedly progressive, but yet he's buddy buddy with Joe Manchin. None of this makes any sense to me. And so, like, if if he were to jump in the race because he says, you know what, Paula, you're not talking about this issue. And I think that West Virginians need to know about this. I think that intellectually speaking, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we should grant him that space. That'd be fantastic. But this is clearly a right. ploy to gain attention. You know, and now I'll tell you right now. Do I want to challenge Shelley Moore Capito, who I think is absolute garbage? If I did that, I would find myself going head to head with Paula Jean Swearingen. Once again, not a fan of Paula Jean Swearingen either. Paula Jean Swearingen threw stones at me because absolutely she just could not stand the fact that I wouldn't dag on basically run down up and down the roads and screaming that Joe Manchin sucked because I knew she couldn't beat Patrick Morrissey. So I supported Joe, and I don't give a shit if you like that or you don't. I don't want to, you know, dog on Richard Ojeda. This isn't about him. This is about pe the people of West Virginia. But it is important for people to know that you have to look at the record, uh, look at the platforms of people. Richard Ojeda has no platform on his website, whereas Paula Jean is very committed to policy, you know. Um, so you have to vet people. And, you know, when it comes to the progressive movement, uh, there is this, there is a leadership crisis, right? Because we're not necessarily mm -hmm. going to have another Bernie Sanders run for president anytime soon. So we're looking for that next progressive hero. And some people say the right things and step up. And so basically my my overall point is that we have to be a lot more cautious and vet people a lot more. Don't be overly skeptical, but just acknowledge that if you have a set of options, really vet these candidates. I think that if you have followed you know, your campaign and your activism pre-campaign, I mean, there's there's no question in my mind you're committed to these ideals and you're going to go to Congress committed and fighting. And even if you lose, you're mm -hmm. going to go down swinging, you know, so that's why I think it's really important. And I wanted to, you know, make it known because a lot of progressives, I think, were, for lack of a better word, duped by Richard Ojeda uh, back in 2018 when he did run, I think, an admittedly good campaign against Carol Miller. But times have changed. And, you know. We need real leadership. I'm, I'm not looking for a celebrity. I'm not looking for someone who's going to make headlines and say the right things. I want a fighter who's going to fight for the people. And that's why I, I thought that this was important to bring up. So thank you for addressing that. I didn't want to put you on the spot. And I will say that if Richard Ojeda is, you know, actually committed to policy, he could debate you. But he doesn't want to do that. Yeah, he's publicly denied at, uh, denied a debate, and uh, that I think that's a disservice to voters. And I think voters need to hear from all sides. And it's it's not it shouldn't be about giving your opponent a microphone and make you you know you being worried about you're going to raise their profile. It, you know, voters didn't need to hear policy from all their candidates so they can have, make informative decisions. Here we are in our primaries June 9th, and we've not had one debate uh, for U.S. Senate. And I really think that's a real disservice to West Virginia voters. And I really think it's a disservice that, uh, uh, you know, Richard Ojeda is refusing to give that to West Virginians. And I think that goes against our democracy. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to run for Congress, you have to be ready to debate because you're constantly debating. Like, this isn't like those idiotic debates that you see on YouTube. Debate me, bro. Like, these are two people who are mm -hmm. running for the United States Senate. So they have to debate, you know? So this is important. So much is on the line. Like, now is not the time to play games. And, you know, to that point about, you know, so much being on the line and us fighting for our survival, I wanted to ask you because you... You've always been fighting. Um, you've always been in the trenches. You haven't stopped. And so, you know, a presidential race not going our way isn't going to change that trajectory for you. So I'm curious. It, it, I don't want to ask you for words of encouragement, but what do you say to people who currently feel like, you know what, I can't deal with electoral politics, so I'm going to check out. How do you get people to still fight after, you know, being faced with so much defeat? Because this is something that I'm asking myself lately. Like, how do I keep, you know, that that spark lit 
Um, and I don't know that there's a good answer. I think that maybe when we're past this election, past this pandemic, maybe the dust will settle and there'll be like a clear message of unity for the left and what we should do. But like, what is your message to people at a time of defeat in terms of like what we should keep doing? Well, it's, I may be the wrong person to ask because I've got a fire in me that I can't put out. I've been fighting for my state for years and win or lose any election. I'm going to continue to fight for my state. And, you know, I'm a mother and a grandmother now, and uh, I do anything for my children and I can't stop. But I know working within the movements throughout the years, you know, make sure that we're working together. Like I said, uh, we're going to suffer some losses identify grifters in our movement and make sure that there's a place for that. But, you know, it's it, it's passing the bullhorn to the people. You know, the people in front of the pain should be in front of the power always. And we always have to continue to unite. We have to continue to stick together. Self-care is important. When you feel beat down, take a breath, get back up and get back to fighting and organizing. We have to stick together. Even, you know, when I've been fighting for water for my state for years, it wasn't about just, you know, the people in Payton City right now that are dealing with a water crisis. It's still about the people in Flint, Michigan that I worked with and people across the country. You know, when somebody out of state says we're having a rally, we're doing this, we need help. Everybody should be busting and showing up and showing up together. Uh, we don't need heroes. We can't look at one person to save us. If we want to save our country and we want a future for our children and grandchildren, my hashtag, Unite Our Fight, is just that. I've been saying that for years. We have to stick together. It's not about partisan politics. It's not about who's left, who's right, even if I'm, you know, as public servants. Everybody don't have to agree on everything, but the common goal should be in making sure that the people in this country have good representation and their needs are met and they're not begging for their basic human rights. So just stick together and move forward. Even Bernie said it. He wasn't looking to be a hero. We heard him over and over and over run for office, local level to federal level. But even if you're not cut out to run for office, there's always a place for somebody in this movement, even if you're making copies for a rally. There's always a place for somebody. You know, I remember one of my mentors, whenever he met somebody, the first thing he said is you are somebody. And remember that. And you are important. Don't give up. We are going to suffer losses, but we have to stick together and we have to keep going. I'm glad that you said, you know, that even if it's making copies, because there really is, and I know that this doesn't sound like much, but like there's no contribution that's too small. Anything that you can do to push us forward in the correct direction, I think that really does matter. And it may feel like everything that we're doing currently isn't going to amount to much, but trust me, it will. And I want to um, mm -hmm. uh, quote what Jamie Peck of the Majority Report said, because she said something recently that resonated with me. She said that the same underlying material conditions that led to you know the rise of Donald Trump, that led to the creation of a Bernie Sanders movement, those are still going to exist. So it's not like all of mm -hmm. a sudden things are going to get better and the movement will dissipate. So long as there is a need for these types of policies to be enacted, I think there's going to be a will to fight. And keep that in mind, because for me, one of the biggest worries that I had after Bernie had dropped out was that, you know, where does the movement go? Can the movement be sustained? And I think the answer is yes. I think that Bernie wasn't the creation of a new movement. I think it was the continuation of previous movements, you know, not just Occupy, but movements before that. So it really, it is important that people don't check out as easy as it may feel to do that. You know, as, um, as a, yeah, don't check out. It's time to check in harder. Yeah, exactly. And it seems like, like to me, it seems alluring to want to check out currently. You know, I try to do self-care mm -hmm. as much as I can. But, you know, we just have to fight harder. And that's why we have to elect people like you to Congress. Because there is a lot of people running for Congress that are phenomenal, that I truly believe will help mm -hmm. transform the country. But you have really struck a chord with people. And I notice this with my audience as well, whenever you come on, because... You are not just sincere, but you really speak to the very specific needs of people in West Virginia and across the country. And I think that that's lacking. Like whenever I hear from a politician, they have these vague, you know, um, general things that their constituents need. But they're not like these aren't lived experiences. These are talking mm -hmm. points. And it's important mm -hmm. that we do elect real people. So uh, tell us what we can do to support your campaign, because you're on the cusp of winning. And if you win this primary... Um, which is, uh, we'll, we'll get the date from you, but if you win this primary, we're in a position to defeat 
Shelly Moore Capito. I, I think I've you alternated between Shelly Moore Capito and Shelly Capito Moore. I always butcher her name, but that's not important because it's we're going to forget. It's Capito. It's okay. Oh, it is. Everybody butchers I, my name too. <laughs> I didn't even pronounce it correctly, but you know what? It doesn't matter <laughs> because she's going to be going bye-bye very soon. Uh, so tell us what we can do to support your campaign, Paula. Well, uh, right now we need new phone bankers um, and we need people to send texts. So if you want to reach out to field, uh, we early voting started today, which people were already voting because they opened up the absentee ballot process to everyone. And people are also mailing in their ballots and their primary was extended to June 9th. So if, if people can reach out to my field person, his name is Andrew at PaulaJean.com. Um, he'll get you hooked up to do that. And also, I mean, I know it's a trying time. But our campaign is 100% people funded. So if everybody can donate a dollar, then that's going to help us send those texts and help make phone calls and things that we need to do. Um, but most importantly, uh, what everybody can do for my campaign is not give up. We still are in this together. And uh, please don't give up hope. I mean, there's, there's children are dying and starving across this country. I feel like our generation has made this mess and it's 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 up to us to fix it so our children don't inherit it. Basically the way that I'm trying to view this is you know fighting shouldn't be a choice for us it should just be automatic regardless of the outcome of elections or you know what state the country or world is in you fight that's what the left does uh the left yeah has and, to and fight. labor you know and the unions back in the rights of workers and start unionizing too i'm very pro-union and we have to make sure that people across the country have the right to collective bargaining and uh making sure that workers are paid a living wage and people are treated right in the workplace and people, you know, we don't have a large homeless population. We're taking care of our veterans when they come home. I mean, all those things, they're just basic human rights. And we, you know, we know we, it, it's not that we don't have money in this country. We have a moral problem. And that moral problem goes into our budgeting. And we're not spending money in ways that we should be. And, and you know what? Nobody should be treated like collateral damage. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to bury my family members to industry and not get anything in return for it, which I shouldn't want anything in return. I just like to have my family members back. So, you know, it, it's it's important. And I just want to thank everybody across the country for everything that they're doing. And you, Mike, for, uh, you know, being in this movement and amplifying the voices of the voiceless. And, you know, because oftentimes candidates do not get the media that they deserve. Um, and you were you are still a great big part of this movement. And thank you for all the hard work that you do. Oh, that means so much. Thank you. Honestly, thank you so much for running because this really is, and we talked about this before um, when we did our panel discussion with Corey Bush and Amy Valella, this is such a huge mm -hmm. self-sacrifice. Like you're giving up so much time, a huge portion of your life. Um, so it, it takes a lot of dedication and willpower to run. And so if there were nobody to run, then this movement would be dead. But the fact that there are so thank many you. great candidates I mean, it, we have something to fight for. It's not over. So thank you so much for running. We will be watching you. your campaign very closely. Uh, thank you so much, Paula. Thank you, Mike.